He took one bold decision at the beginning of his career to help a dying colleague who could only whisper thank you. It led to fame, acclaim, a knighthood, and many firsts. In this episode of Ghana's Greats, the business giant who broke many glass ceilings, Se Sam Jordan. Sam Jonah has broken rocks, miles underground, and brokered deals over the boardroom table. He has advised world leaders and discovered a passion for golf. He is probably one of the few men in the world to be knighted by the Queen of England nearly 30 years after sweating as a miner in the searing heat, miles beneath the town where he grew up. It all began in 1949. Young Jonah was born in a military camp in Chibi, in Ghana's eastern region. His father, a sergeant major and World War II veteran, served in the Royal West African Frontier Force. These are men of the Gold Coast Regiment, many of whom helped to drive the Italians from Abyssinia. When his father left the army, he set up a construction company and moved the family to Obuasi, where young Sam Jonah started school. One of his oldest friends, His Majesty Utumfo Osaitutu II, revealed at Sam Jonah's 70th anniversary gathering that taught him some useful lessons. Over the years, Sam has sought to claim the bragging rights of a senior brother with such ebullience that you would think he was six years older. <laughs> Unfortunately for him, nature has a way of restoring equilibrium. As it happens, I'm the fifth child and Sam is the seventh child. <laughs> so you can decide where the seniority lies. Sam is a quintessential Obuasi boy, born into a large but very enterprising family. Uncle Master Pra was probably the most famous educationist in the whole of Adansi at the time, and naturally, education was of great importance to the family. Being part of a large family has its pressures, but it also has its advantages, as the Hollywood legend Bob Hope once testified. With siblings like Nana Pra and Pa Kofi, all bundles of intellect, a climate of ceaseless sibling arguments sharpened a highly analytical mind, developed critical thinking, and an unyielding winning mentality. Obwasi itself had its own apartheid structure in place. The system stretched discrimination and segregation beyond indigence to other migrant menial workers. Obwasi, because almost all the management that you saw at the mine were whites, you associated the management with only white people. You, you understand what I'm saying? Okay, sure. Now, and you associated actually ordinary miners with, with, with it, yeah. But interesting enough, most of the miners then were migrant labor. They were from Mali, or Burkina Faso, or Guinea, or Côte d'Ivoire. They were, and, and some of them came also from the north, the, the, the Gatis and all of that. Uh, and so you actually saw that they were the, they did most of the, uh, let's say the actual, mean, yeah, the actual mean, mining. Uh, yeah. uh, and, and therefore, in a way, your horizon was limited to that because you did not see yourself going beyond. Therefore, his decision to work underground at the Ashanti Goldfields Corporation's Obwasa Mine after Adisador College with men who had barely gone to school shocked many. There were tough days underground, 
but some Jonah learned to survive. It was during these exciting days at Ashanti that tragedy struck. One day, he was underground when the chamber ceiling fell in, trapping and killing miners. In those days when I joined the mine, safety was not fashionable. Okay. You know, we didn't, we didn't care. The mining was associated with death. You know, if you went underground, you didn't know how many people may come out. You were just a statistic. Uh, people were dying and it was accepted as part of the course, really. So I uh, was working underground with a group of who I was supervising and, yeah, and I noticed that the working place was all dusty. You know, we had, we had cup lamps, okay. so not poorly lit. Then I looked around and looked at there were cup lamps on the, on the, on the floor. Okay. So people were screaming and all of that. And the half of, the, literally the roof had collapsed. Oh. So people had died, people had been trapped. And miners are like soldiers. You forget that you are in danger. We all rush there. Never mind that things are happening around you. And all of them, everybody instinctively, or impossible, every miner will do that. Okay. As I'm sure most soldiers do also. And so I went in there. We all went and we held, because I was the most senior person, we helped to free somebody who was trapped under a massive rock. And we took him to where the lift was for him to be taken up. And it was quite a struggle getting him out. So when we managed to get that, and as we got him into the lift, I had to say, because I was a supervisor, mm -hmm. and he looked at me, and it was fancy, and in his impeccable fancy. He said, Mura, I say, I say, Papa. And I was touched, because I, mm -hmm. I noticed that. that I didn't see that I was a hero. I mean, it had been a group effort, and all of us had rushed in and done it. But I was touched because he clearly was in a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. He was taken away. And within two hours, we were told when I came up from the surface that he had died. Oh, he died? Yeah, he died. And I was, I was really affected by that experience. Unfortunately, we, one had to witness similar such incidents, which was, uh, as I said, unfortunate. But, uh, uh, therefore, when I came back and I started working and I got to a level of, which was high enough, I insisted that if there was a death, uh, the chief executive myself, had, even if you had to wake me up, you had to wake me up and tell me. So people were put on notice, you know, because you knew that this would be reported. Okay. And we put systems in place to ensure that, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, safety became uh, everybody's concern. He won a scholarship to study mining engineering at the Camborne School of Mines, England, which later awarded him an honorary doctorate. He returned to Ashanti and moved up the ranks. The Asantehini recalls the excitement and jolly rides when they bought their first car. He was a mine captain and we bought a car. We named the car Amasewa. <laughs> 17-year-old Morris Minor, and the guy was retiring and we had to buy, how much was it in cities? I think something. 17 cities, yes. And he didn't know how to drive, I didn't know how to drive and we were driving. On the hill going down, we, that, what did we do? We hit, <laughs> the brake failed, the brakes failed us and then we had an accident there. But we were lucky to survive and we put our car back and we left. He then embarked on a sojourn to London to study for a Master of Science degree at the Imperial College where the two great friends reconnected. It also happened that I had also arrived in the UK to study at the Kilburn Polytechnic and later to the Metropolitan Land University of London and we reconnected again in the heart of London sharing all the things and dare I say all the permissible transgressions of ad adventurous youth. <laughs> Sam Jonas' life was moving apace. 
as he became the first Ghanaian general mines manager of Obuasi. For the avoidance of any doubts, the following are emphasized. A. The president, the vice president, and all ministers and their deputies are dismissed from office. B. Parliament is dissolved. C. The Council of State is abolished. D. All political parties are prescribed. Sam Jonas' life was moving apace as of 1982. On the return of Jerry Rollins, the head of state nominated Jonah, who was 31, to be Ashanti's deputy managing director. In an unprecedented move, he stepped back to become the first Ghanaian general mines manager of Obuasi. Um, Sir so Sam Jonah started off as the deputy managing director of Ashanti Gofels. And at the time, um, at one point, the general manager for Obuasi at the time was on leave or went on leave. So he decided to come down and act as general manager, which was a great below him at the time. But I think he wanted to prove a point. And so during his short period there, he did ruffle feathers. Um, he, he particularly brought, brought a new culture in there in terms of housekeeping. Chase people went on inspections with people and generally started changing the culture and, and attitude of people because it made people aware that your environment counts as much as the quality of work you do. Okay. So um, that started off and in, in one situation, I don't remember, but I had to go to his office for something. And then we, we got into conversation. We both realized we had been to the same secondary school at the Saddle. And so that started um, the relationship. Uh, there and uh, it took off from there. Dan Wiredu is a former president of the Ghana Chamber of Mines with mining experience straddling over three decades. He worked at Obuasi as the first black chief engineer and tells us Sam Jonah and his elevation through hard work and exhibition of great leadership skills. Now, this is Mr. Warren. Mr. Roland and I mean one man In 1986, the late tiny Roland, the founder of Lonro, which owned Ashanti, appointed Sir Sam Jonah as managing director. This was at a time when production at the company's single mine had deteriorated and the industry had yet to see a black man at the helm. By the International Finance Corporation came to the rescue. Cambridge trained Mark Kitley was the officer in charge of West Africa. We met him at the Travelers Club in London where he first told us why IFC decided to pump money into the operations of AGC. And IFC uh, took the lead in mobilizing international capital for Ghana. You need to remember the context this was. This was 1986. This was in the early days of the Economic Recovery Program, the ERP, when the, the Ghana government was taking radical and courageous steps to, to rebuild the economy uh, under Finance Minister Kwesi Botchwin. Courageous decisions were made to float the exchange rate, to release controls on, on, on uh, investment, um, to uh, restructure the tax environment, to attract international capital. And Ghana's mineral code had just been updated to make an attractive environment for international mining companies to invest. But somebody had to take the lead. And so IFC uh, took the courageous decision to, to enter this environment and to put its weight behind Ashanti Goldfields. Ashanti already was a long established company, but for many years it had uh, found difficulty to attract international capital because of Ghana's difficult economic situation. As a result, that the mine had not been able to invest uh, to continue its growth. So IFC supported uh, a $40 million investment program. He later joined AGC as its chief finance officer. 
I walked into his office uh, as, as a nervous young financial executive in trepidation to meet someone who was already a legendary business figure in Ghana. And I was disarmed by his charm, his modesty, his humility, and above all, his wonderful humanity. So Sam is a, is a, is a passionate and warm-hearted human being, and he connects with all people, from the highest to the lowest, and establishes an immediate rapport. And I, I felt immediately you know, that this was uh, a, a great human being as well as a great business leader. It, it's a privilege to work with a great business leader as, as is Sir Sam. Um, and by the time I made that uh, decision, I had worked with him as a banker and as a financial advisor for altogether eight years. So the, the invitation came uh, as I was sitting at my desk in Washington and the phone rang. It was Sir Sam on the phone from Ghana. Uh, guess what? We're going public in London. On the, we're, we're returning to the London Stock Exchange. We need a CFO and you'll be my choice. And uh, without hesitation, I said, uh, Sam, I'm your man. What we are saying is that don't destroy your country. The company was public until the military government and the General Champong took 55% share in 1972, making it a partnership between the government and Lonro. In the quest for growth, Jonah and his team convinced the partners that Better days were ahead if the company went public again. Once Ashanti listed in both Ghana and London, the government held 17% of the company and Lonro 27%. Between 1994 and 2004, Ashanti went on the acquisition hand in an attempt to be both an entrepreneur as well as a conservative company. It extended its operations in Ghana, Australia, Zimbabwe, Guinea, and Tanzania. In 1996, Ashanti became the first African-based company to be listed on the New York Stock Exchange. We had been listed for two years in London, but of course the biggest capital market in the world is the US. And I said to Sir Sam, we need to be there. And he said, that will be a tall order. There has never been an African company on the New York Stock Exchange. So I said, we will be the first. So he said, what do you need? I said, I need a budget. I need a good lawyer to help me. And I need a team. And he said, you, you have what you need. And I set to it. And six months later, I was standing with Sir Sam on the balcony of the New York Stock Exchange. And Sir Sam ring, rang the division bell to open the trading on the big board. It was the first time an African operating company had been listed in New York, and Sir Sam was the first African chief executive to ring that bell. Of course, many others have followed. So it was one of the proudest moments of my professional career, and we really had the sense we were making history. We were taking Ashanti and Ghana onto the, the world financial stage. In his new position, Sam Jonah introduced his Africanization policy he wanted to change an industry that was run by whites. He wanted to attract his countrymen to the industry by forcing expatriates to fulfill their contractual obligations to impart skills. In, I, I'm ex, an example where I was given industrial attachments, did my MBA and got exposure. There are other similar stories where a lot of people were given so training, that training, strong training focus did build capacity within the company and the knowledge and practical base grew. And I mean, if you look across the mining industry, there's very few people that you don't have products of Obwasi within any of the mines in this country. Moreover, Jonah wanted to cut the expense of expatriate. This policy was unpopular among expatriates, but it was all about the big picture in a growing company. Former Deputy Minister of Finance, Mona Corte, who was once Head of Treasury at AGC, recounts his new policy had at its core a deliberate attempt to bring in more women. Mr. Jonah was very good with bringing women to the table 
mm. to also lend their voice to decision making. Because before I came into Ashanti, there weren't many women at all. It was only the head of HR that was a, a, a lady. The rest of the ladies were maybe f telephonists, so forth. Very few women. So they were not high level. They were not high. Well, there was one high level and a few lower mm -hmm. down cafeteria, but they were in what you would predominantly see as female type careers, mm -hmm. catering, okay. telephone operators, and so forth. Within a short time that I was there, I saw that he was targeting, recruiting women mm -hmm. who had trained in mining and mining related areas into the company. So by, I would say by 19, 1996, we had female geologists, we had female truck drivers, we had ladies in the metallurgy department, and, and these were engineers, you know. We had a female board member. I mean, I was hiring accountants. Many of the underground miners even had all these superstition okay. about women coming underground and so forth. So. It, there was a, a, sea, a, a glass wall that had to be broken, you know, and he did it in a nice way. He actually made us do it ourselves. James Anaman, a former press secretary of both Generals Champon and FWK Ekufu's military government, was also one of those brought in to fulfill this mission and charged to scout for investors. I had completed a 12-year stint with the Ghana High Commission in London where I was a minister councillor in charge of information. Then it happened that we needed to send a document to Accra rather urgently. And uh, it fell on me to deliver the document to Mr. Sam Jonah, as he then was, in his hotel in Metropole. That was the very first time I, I had met him. So when I got there, we got talking and he asked me uh, what I intended to do when I returned home because I heard that I had come to the end of my tour. So yes, he made sure that I could speak to all issues relating to mining as Ashanti Gold Fields had it and mining as a factor in Ghana's economic development. That also came in hand when we were looking out of Ghana to Africa. But in 1999, Ashanti faced a liquidity squeeze. It came at a bad time for the company. The root of the problem was hedging done by the company when the gold price was low. Mark Keatley explains this was a bruising time for them and the most difficult of his career. Most major gold mining companies suffered that week. Ashanti suffered more than most because as a Ghanaian company, we had much tighter credit limits than, for example, the big Canadian, uh, Australian, or South African companies. So I could see the writing on the wall, and I could see we had a crisis. So again, I walked into Sir Sam's office, and I said, we have a problem on our hands, and it is the most serious financial problem that this company has faced before. There is a solution, and I believe I will find that solution. Um, I have to get on the next plane to London, and I will not come back until I've solved this and after I've solved it, I will then step down. Former Talo Ghana boss Kwekwe Wotri was another fine brain that was drafted to AGC as lead for business development and strategy. He's convinced the crisis was worsened by other pressures. But I remember Sam coming into my office one Friday uh, around uh, late September, early October saying, uh, you know what, uh, our CFO is going up to London to sort this problem out. I think you better go with him to assist him. And uh, Sam was that kind of person who uh, delegated a great deal and trusted a great deal, was sure that his lieutenants would deliver. And uh, sure enough, I went up with uh, the CFO at the time, Mark Keatley, and uh, the crisis sort of unfolded from there. Um, and I can tell you that it was probably uh, as stressful a time f that I can remember for AGC, um, we had to deal with a number of hedge counterparties yeah. who, you know, we owed money to. Uh, we owed money to our normal banks. We had a, a suit against our, uh, from our shareholders who filed suit against management that we were not managing the, the, the value of the company very well. 
And then, of course, the government of Ghana itself joined suit with that shareholder group uh, who wanted us out. But uh, Sam had so much loyalty and so much belief from its banks, uh, Ashanti Goldfield banks, that I do recall that when that suit was filed, uh, we had a posse of the banks fly into Ghana and tell the president at the time that, you know, they were solidly behind Sam. And that was the kind of loyalty he engendered. For James Anaman, recalling those memories evoke a lot of emotion as they came under attack, both from within and without, a situation which eventually left him with a stroke. That's something that always gets me emotional. Because um, when Ashanti started to look out, I was given the role of ensuring that important investors were interested in important as an important stock as Ashanti. It got to a point that when we were about to to make an important agreement, that was when unfortunately the chairman of the board was sacked. He was then the Minister for Finance. The mining minister was also sacked. Plus, the guy who was in charge of the Minerals Commission. And unfortunately, the market had thought that with these people, government officials on the board, in the boardroom, the interests of the government would be seen to at all times so they could relax that I sent you would government of Ghana would not one day come and seize the company because they had an interest in there. And Mr. Sam Junior was, I mean, another casualty because he had made people aware that the Ghanaian could do anything. And suddenly he had nowhere to hide because of circumstances beyond our control. Not that Ashanti could not have uh, paid, but because of certain factors which are too numerous to, 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 to go into. When the dust settled, Ashanti and the Jonah began to flourish again. As it grew, the hunter became the hunted. Success attracted the interests of numerous companies. Jonah was faced with yet another tough choice to grow from within or agree to be part of a bigger outfit. We did a certain amount of restructuring. So the first thing we did was we restructured the hedge book. Uh, I actually headed up the committee to restructure that hedge book. And we brought in some experts to look over the hedge book. And we took a number of years to unwind those, uh, those positions. Uh, so we, we, we did that in a very orderly fashion. Um, the next thing we did was to raise the necessary funds to pay off not just the bridge loan, but also to shore up the equity because we, we owed money to the bank, so we needed to do that. So we, we went through a fairly orderly process selling half of our prize asset at the time, which was the Gator Mine in Tanzania, and uh, that raised us several hundred million dollars, and that also helped. But that, all of that took, as I said, three to six months. The $1.8 billion merger between Ashanti and Anglo Gold then the seventh and second largest gold producers respectively, was far from a measure of equals. Despite this, Ashanti's management secured key positions within Anglo Gold Ashanti, with Jonah becoming the executive president of the merged entity. Kwame Adokofo was one of those who joined Sam Jonah in South Africa after almost two decades, starting at AGC as audit manager. We had a crisis which was well beyond our control. How did Sam Juna manage that? I think as a leader, he was calm and managed it strategically. And what people must remember is that we went through the management of that hedging crisis in a way which facilitated the merger with Anglo. So he managed it calmly, professionally, and in very trying circumstances, the business stayed afloat and the fundamentals were 
solid enough for Anglo Gold of uh, South Africa, which was another major player, to want to merge with us. So I would say he managed the hedging price as well. Sam Jonah, the driving force between Ashanti's growth, sees opportunities where others don't. In this time, Ashanti grew from a single mine in Ghana to the second largest gold producer in the world. After his time at Anglo Gold Ashanti, Jonah became a serial director. Some junior mining companies approached him to guide them to success, as he had done for Ashanti. But exactly what is it about Sam Jonah that makes him great? His former colleagues believe he's a true leader who puts people first in all his undertakings. Perhaps his greatest legacy, according to Kwekwawotri, is grooming a generation of young Ghanaians who are now giant in varied spheres. Overall, uh, Sam tended to be a fairly optimistic person, uh, ten tended to see humor in difficult situations. But I would say one of his important traits was he believed in his team, he believed in his management, he believed that we could work our way through the issue. And I think that was very important in terms of getting things done. He was loyal to us as his management team, and we were loyal to him. And, um, you know, despite the anxiousness and the nervousness from time to time, just a certain determination that we would get through this. Sam came into Ashanti and revolutionized the company. Uh, he really broke some of the, the barriers that existed between the foreigners and the locals. He really empowered our local workforce. He provided training. He sent them out. Uh, he really changed the face of Ashanti and in a way that had never been done before. He was a very young man. He was in his 30s, uh, but he had grown up with a mining culture. So what I would say about Sam, he had passion for his business. He believed in his business. He believed in the transformative power of the business, and he delivered. On his part, James Anaman believes Sam Jonah is loyal to a fault, even at the peril of his life. Family had come from the United Kingdom, that where they were studying, to be with them when we had to travel. So he asked me, so, if they are not doing it, after all, we're going to have uh, over that, uh, an airplane, an airplane, you will have your normal hotel room. You can spend the time with your family in your room, that when I come, we all come back. So at that material moment, I had my wife on it and my two daughters, together with his secretary and himself and the two pilots. And then, fortunately, the, um, the pilots had to take some measures mid-air to ensure that the pressure in the cabin was not that could be destructive. And that was, to say that it's quite frightening. I wish I had more tolerable words for that. <laughs> so we were all in that mode. Then he looked around and said, look, look at Kamba, look at Kamba. You look at infantry, you look at terrible wind in your city. Is it because of the small death that you are so frightened? Uh, but you are lucky. So you go down with your family. <laughs> there was a family who all go with <laughs> him. There will be no, you will not be bothered about Oh, you love yes, you. and uh, how you bury your wife, yeah. you will be buried in one chapter. But my family is there. They are waiting for me to land and all that. So he had a way of making difficult situations more tolerable. Okay. That's a mark of a good leader. Some Jonah is a good leader. I don't care what people say about him. Big people, however, seem to be about the law and are untouchable. Well, not everybody likes everything about him, as former President Rawlings had caused to describe him with rather harsh words. And to think that I'm accused of ordering the demolition because I had a bone to pick with his Sam Jonah. Oh, Sam Jonah. By the way, is not unknown to have a treacherous and greedier appetite than your little hotel. Well, for the most part of my career, he was the president of Ghana, and uh, I have to put it on record that it was, for the most part, he was very, very helpful to me. In fact, uh, 
very supportive of my, of my tenure. The former president gave as a justification for the demolition of the hotel. They believed that the hotel had been sited on a waterway. Mm -hmm. There was no due process. If there had been due process, legal authority would have been obtained for the demolition to take place. You know, the absence of due, uh, due, due process leads to unnecessary speculation as to motive. And you can understand now why people were, quest people were saying, speculating, that the hotel had been destroyed because of an association with me. As a matter of fact, the hotel was owned by a very dear friend of mine, Nahalaj Yusuf Ibrahim. Mm -hmm. But I can say categorically, I have never been an interested party in terms of equity in the hotel. So it is tragic that even that speculation could be a reason for a demolition. But it goes beyond that because what it does is that when things are done in this Rambo style manner, it undermines confidence in Ghana, in, in Ghana as a safe place to invest. And for me, that is the important lesson that ought to be taken out of this. Jonah says his parents taught him all he knows about leadership. They encouraged humility, told him that good days are not forever and that he should never give up. Right, I was born in Chibi. Uh, I was one of 10 kids, uh, but I was, uh, <clears throat> I was the only one who was born outside. Uh, Obuasi. Everybody else was born in Obuasi. But I was brought up in Obuasi, uh, where my grandparents were, and where my mother was also, and my father. Uh, soon after I had been born, my father took an early retirement from the military. Uh, I was actually born in the military camp in Chebi. So my father set up his own company called Thomas Jones and Sons. He was into construction of roads. So his uh, business took him all over. Uh, Ghana and of course in Nigeria. I suspect that my father must have been one of the first non-Nigerians but African to have won a contract to construct a road in Nigeria. So his business took him out of Obuasi uh, most of the time, yeah, constantly. And my father was, had a very strict view of what idleness meant. Uh, my father was not keen if he walked into the house to see you idle, so to speak. Yeah, he, when my father walked in, he expected you to be either holding a book or carrying out some chore. And then, then you were spared his, his wrath. I had to wake up at five o'clock in the morning every day because my father used to tell us that it was unproductive to be in bed after five o'clock in the morning. And to get you to appreciate that, five o'clock in the morning or bef just before that, you would, you would have a sprinkling of cold water straight from the fridge. And oh. that, was, that was a rude abortion, so it is pretty. Since Anglo Gold Ashanti, Jonah has sat on at least 18 boards of companies, including the Global Advisory Council of the Bank of America. He's also the founder and chairman of Jonah Capital, a private investment holding company based in South Africa. His council has extended beyond the business world when former South African President Thabo Mbeki set up the International Investment Advisory Council in 2000, Jonah was the first and only African to sit on it. He has also been an advisor to Nigerian President Olusegun Obasanjo, his successor Umaru Musa Yaradua, and also Goodluck Jonathan. He was a founding member of Ghanaian President John Kofor's Investment Advisory Council and advised the late president of Zambia, Levi Mwanawasa, on investment promotion. Jonah was also on Kofi Annan's UN Global Compact Advisory Council. He has helped the president of Togo to put together a team to formulate strategy for the country. On June 25, 2003, Jonah received an honorary knighthood in recognition of his achievement as an African businessman at St. James Palace in London. In 2006, Jonah received the Order of the Star of Ghana, the nation's highest award. He is named among the greatest Africans of all time by Harvard University and has so far received 
over five lifetime achievement awards, including that of the Commonwealth Business Council. He was recently decorated by his alma mater, Imperial College of London, with the highest honor in recognition of his outstanding contribution to the world. He is also the Chancellor of the University of Cape Coast. And as former Vice Chancellor of the school, Professor Kool Paul puts it, he's perhaps the best thing that has happened to the institution. One thing that struck me was in 2013, January 2013, um, he came to spend one full week on campus, interacting with unions, interacting with um, staff, both teaching and non-teaching staff, and visiting all the projects that we have on campus. And so for me, that was, that was a kind of uh, close relationship, something that brought him closer to the university community and that brought him closer to understand uh, some of the happenings um, uh, of the university. One uh, probably la last but not the least is the endowment fund that he established for the university. But that was not under my, time, my of term course. of office. It was under Reverend Professor Obeng's term of office. But I benefited in the sense that when we set up the Directorate of Research, Innovation and Consultancy, um, we consulted him and he released 300,000 Ghana cities for us to start a research fund for the University of Cape Coast. Hey guys, welcome to GHTube. Today we look at top 10 richest people in Ghana. At number three is Sir Sam Jonah with a net worth of $1.2 billion. Despite all these successes, Sir Sam Jonah maintains that he is not a wealthy man and that he is merely resourceful. He has been reported by African journalists and bloggers as having a net worth of between $500 and $600 million and has been celebrated as the richest man in Ghana. My father, just to drive them with the point, on their house was an inscription. Okay. okay, and that was ingrained here. In other words, your name is far more important than your riches. And I, I have taken offense uh, when, for instance, I have been defined by what people think I, 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 I have. In other words, when I hear the nonsense that oh, they say the third Richard, fourth Richard, fifth Richard, man, all of that, I, 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 it caused me a lot of grief. In his private life, Sam Jonah is a philanthropist par excellence and has sponsored many needy students as education remains his passion. Former ambassador and journalist Alhaji Harunata recounts how, when all hope was lost, Sam Jonah funded his medical treatments abroad to save his life. He saved my life. There was a time when I had a life-threatening ailment and I had to undergo brain surgery. Sam was the one who paid the bulk of the money I needed for my surgery in Europe. Wow. Yeah, he did it not once, but twice. After the initial surgery, I had to do a follow-up surgery again. It was Sam who coughed out the money for me. So when people talk about others and mention words like treachery and so on, I don't want to hear it. We should learn to uh, give praise where praise is due. No human being is perfect. Even the one accusing, doing the accusation, is not perfect. When I sit here and accuse you, I'm not perfect. Uh -huh. So as to the perfection we try to look in other human beings, it's just a certain idealism that doesn't exist. But if I am to say, what is a good man? Sam is a good man. He's done that to me. Oh, yeah, he's done that to me. It was the bulk of the money. I just helped here and there, but the bulk of the money I needed to go to Europe, he gave it to me. Why should he? He didn't have to, he could have said he didn't have it, or he could have said he had other priorities. But he wired the money to me. I didn't even have a foreign account, and he was even laughing at me that, well, <laughs> I don't have a foreign account. He wired it to a friend's account, 
and we paid the hospital in, in, in Austria. So um, his philanthropy for me goes just beyond what people are saying. Maybe people have received uh, a little help here, a little help there, fine. But for me, it was a life and death situation. The jet setting entrepreneur enjoys fishing. He is reconnecting with abundant interests like cycling and playing the piano. Golf, however, remains his passion. It brings back memories of a battle around the golf course nearly five decades ago. After dinner, after seven o'clock, let's say, I watched uh, the news from one channel to another till about 10 p.m. I'm usually asleep by 10.30, asleep by 10.30. And now I'm up before five o'clock. And as I told you, from five o'clock, I'm going through my emails and WhatsApp and all of that. Uh, and then I go to the gym at six o'clock. Uh, and then <clears throat> I'm home. The gym is in, in my compound, so it's part of the, uh, the residential agreement. So <clears throat> I go to the gym and then occasionally I'll swim after that. Uh, and now I've had it playing the piano, so I come straight and come and play the piano. So I go, I first have, in the yeah, first things in the morning. And then I have a show. I'll be ready to go to the office at quarter to nine. I don't like breakfast. Uh, I, I act best. I, I, I am at my best when on an empty stomach. So I don't, I don't like breakfast. So I go to work <clears throat> and I leave the office about quarter to one, come home, which is five minutes away anyway. And I have lunch and then I shoot off to uh, the golf club and I go and play golf from about 1.30, 2 o'clock till about 5, 5.30. Then I come back home and uh, have dinner and go with his stuff again. That's typically that report it is. And then of course weekends are different. Saturday morning, 6.30, I'm at the golf course. I play golf. I get home about 12 o'clock. Jonah saw no barriers. He was determined to get to the highest in anything that he did. This sentiment is echoed in his biography where Taylor writes, Jonah was determined to build a first world company, to dispel the unspoken belief that coming from the third world implied that he would be a third-rate businessman.